Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Booz. I'm a Postgres advocate with Redgate Software, and I am working through Advent of Code 2022 using Postgres and SQL, uh, attempting not to use a procedural language under the covers in a function or store procedure like PLPG SQL or Python. So I'm on day 10, I've been working through these slowly. It is now the new year, uh, and I'll just keep doing these as I can because it's a good learning opportunity for me. So day 10, let's flip over and see what we're talking about with day 10. Day 10 was you fell off the rope bridge, you're in the river, the elves walk away and they say, hey, meet us somewhere. They don't tell you where. And you remember you have that device from, I think it was day seven, uh, that was broken. So you pull it out, it is still broken, but you realize that you might be able to replace the screen uh, if you could figure out the commands that are going across the screen to light up pixels. And so basically we're given a set of, of, of commands of uh, you know to the CPU and it has a single register. And so we're simply keeping track of the value that is in that register for every cycle of the CPU. It's either no op, which means the value doesn't change, or it's an addition, positive or negative. Every time you have an, uh, a no op, that takes one CPU cycle. Every add takes two CPU cycles. And the little trick here is you don't do the addition, whatever the value is after the add X, you don't actually add that value until the second, the end of the second CPU cycle. And so, uh, you know, the, in this case, we'd have no op uh, and the, the register starts at one. So we'd have a value of one and he talks through that down below. We have a value of one and then we get to add X. So the cycle number two is still a value of one. And then at the end of cycle three, we now have a value of four because we added one to the value that was in the X register. And then at the end, we need to look at the cycles. Uh, you figured out somehow that the cycles for the 20th, 60th, 100th, 140th, 180th, and 220 cycles, uh, there's a signal strength thing. And so you have to look in the values of each of those cycles. So every CPU cycle, find those specific ones. There's a long set of sample data here. And basically say, when all is said and done, you find all of that, you take each of those values for each of those specific cycle numbers, multiply them out and you get a value in the end. And so uh, how do we do that? Well, let's flip over and talk about what this looked like for me. So I uh, currently, I went ahead and just, uh, I'm gonna, I created a table. I inserted the sample data that is on that page. I just copied it out, put it in here and did my little trick to break it out into rows and insert it into the data, uh, into the table. So I could just work from it with it from the table. This is what it looks like. Let's see what we have in there. All right, so that's the sample data that he gave us. So uh, same as we've done before, right? I'm just simply gonna say, this is what the signatures look like. I decided to do an array again, and I have to learn. Um, so I called the signal for signal strength uh, from sig, and we simply get now an array with the command and the value. And you'll see down here somewhere we have a no op. There's a no op there. All right, so now we just had to be able to say, hey, somehow keep track. If it's a no op, um, keep the previous value. If it's add X, but it's the first add X, don't do anything unless it's the second add X. I made this way too complicated. I'll just be honest with you. I ended up creating another uh, just Boolean. I called iteration start, I start. And if it's true, it means it was the first of the two cycles for the ad. And that then meant if it is an ad and it's true the next time around, then set it to false because I'm on the second step. Uh, you can go through this. this. I ended up making this too complicated. And I'm going to show you in a second someone that made it a lot less complicated. But it did work, all right? I could say, hey, this is the first cycle. Uh, it's supposed to be two cycles worth. It's an addition. So this is the first one. Uh, now it's the second one, so go ahead and add that value. We get 16, so at the end of cycle two, the register is 16. The next one is another add, right? So we don't add anything to it yet until the second cycle of that addition. It was negative 11, now we're down to five. This did work. It just ended up being, I honestly started on this, was like, oh, this is so simple. And 10 minutes later, I had kind of this convoluted solution, uh, but I got the value. So. It did work out, and, and let me just show you again what that is. You'll see that the cycle is increasing over time. If you look at cycle number 20, 
the value is 21. So it's 20 times 21 plus uh, register 60, uh, 60 times 19 plus whatever the value for 100 is and so forth. And that's what this value is. All right, so great, we got there. Much easier solution. If you watched any of my previous uh, value, my previous videos, you'll see that we've talked about some of these function. One of them is string to table. So string to table does, and I've talked about with ordinality. And so I'm basically going row by row. What This was Vic Faring. It was a great solution. Super simple. He goes row by row, splits it to a table, and adds the ordinality. So I know the ordinality becomes, uh, well, let me just show you, the row number. All right, so I, I take the or sorry, uh, the row number over the whole data set. The row number is effectively the cycle. I could just uh, alias this to cycle. And now all he ended up doing, if I were to put that in a CTE, I'm not going to do this right now. It really, this is just the sum of everything above it. So if I say, hey, go to cycle 20, sum with a window function, all rows preceding. And so whatever the sum is at that moment, so you'll notice that only, uh, you know, in this case, this is an add, so only the second row, because I split them out, has that value. It was a much better solution. Uh, I wish I would have thought of it. Anyway, so there, you got two for one. Now, the cool part was star number two. For star number two, I got to show you this because it's pretty cool. Basically, is, hey, you realize now that you have the signal strength that the CRT is this is giving instructions to the pixels, a sprite moving across the screen and the pixels that need to be lit up to show you something on that screen. The screen is six rows, uh, six rows and 40 columns wide. And then basically timing the cycle to the sprite position, if they match up, you illuminate that pixel, right? So the, and the pixel being uh, the same as the, the cycle essentially. And the way this works is the sprite is three characters wide. The value in the X register, remember this thing back here. Uh, let me show you. Let's get back here. This value is the middle position of the pixel. So that means you have a, uh, the sprite is three wide. So you, in this case, it would be 15, 16, and 17 would be the total width of that sprite. And so if the cycle number is included anywhere in that those three digits, those three pixels, illuminate the cycle pixel is essentially what we're doing. That is how it works. And if you look at his example, he shows you that. It took me a little bit to really figure out what was going on here. And with the sample data that we have, I don't think I've changed anything. So with the sample data we should get, if we ended up collecting all those information, all that data and putting it together, so I took the exact same information, but now all I'm doing then is saying, hey, I added a little array onto it. So let me show you what I added to the array. Right, so for this uh, function, it's two cycles deep. And so if either of these, and, and again, the uh, I, I left that piece out if you read the instructions, even though it's 40 characters wide, the pixel is, it goes from zero to 39, 40 to 79 and so forth. So it, I needed to minus one essentially. And so we start at zero. And so uh, we get that out. So is cycle, is this cycle included in that array? Yes, it is. Remember, uh, this is one way of doing a array comparison. So I have an array called cycle. I'm sorry, I have the ID, the integer of cycle and an array in this case uh, called SP. And is it contained? And if it is, what do we end up seeing? So I'm going to show you without the aggregation, right? So now I'm just going through that and this is what we get. So if those two things match, zero is contained in this array, we illuminate the pixel. Is one contained in that array? Yes, we illuminate the pixel. Is two contained in this array? No. Don't illuminate the pixel and so forth. When you do that, and then the other thing I had to do is keep track of each row. So every 40 characters was a row. So I did a little simple division here. That's it. That allows me to group by that column. So every notice if I go down here to cycle 40, right? So all the way to cycle 39, because 0 to 39 is 40 total. I get 
uh, my 40 pixels together. I can group on that now with an aggregate. And sure enough, when I group on that, we get, ta-da, the same thing. Notice we have two uh, pound symbols, three pound symbols, four pound symbols. And if I go back to his example, it matches up. All right, very fun. So then we get to take the real data. I got to show you this just to get out. So we're going to truncate 10. Uh, I've done this a few times. We'll import 10, all right, 142 commands uh, of NOAP. And when we do all that, ooh, let me show you this first, right? Because it's fun to see it without. It's kind of like it comes into view, right? So without grouping it, we just have all of these things. We're going down through. This is the real data. And the other thing I had to do is remember that when I get to the next row, the value in the register never grows very large uh, because of where it's moving. Uh, so I had to keep track and essentially add uh, data, add a value to it because I'm getting to that pixel on the screen. So that's what's happening here. So when I do that and I do the aggregation, I get a bunch of letters. I don't know how easy that is to see in the video, but we have the letter Z. All right, let me see if I can do that. There's the letter Z. There's the letter C and so forth. I mean, it's eight capital letters. And we had to put those into the, um, as a solution to the puzzle. So that is how I solved day 11. Uh, really fun to take, you know, it didn't have to really change any of the output here. I ended up adding the array because it was simpler than doing another CTE for me. I could have simply created a new CTE, so not changed the output of star one. I could have changed nothing, just added a kind of in intermediate CTE to clean it up. This just ended up being a little bit simpler for me. And then I could do my math. Hope that was fun. It was really cool. I actually, my son was coming up and I was solving this. I was like, oh, come here, you got to see this. Uh, taking all these little pound symbols and they group together and we get to see some cool letters. So that is day 10 and it's been fun to get at least 10 days in. Another 15 more days. I'm already in the new year. We'll see how this works out. Uh, it's been fun so far and hopefully I'll keep going one or two a week and we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Take care.